Hello, everyone. I'm Natalie from Numbers Protocol. At Numbers, we are on a mission to restore trust in the media that we consume every day, which is at its lowest time at the moment. Well, we have been halfway through of 2024, which is a year of super elections happening around the world, everywhere. And probably also half of us already vote or is going to vote by the end of the year. Uh, as a team that born out of Taiwan, uh, we, with our rich experience previously with the global partners around the world, we think that it's a, our privilege but also our responsibility to bring our experience and our solutions back to Taiwan. Uh, in the early January of ta uh, 2024, Taiwan is the first country that kickstarted the elections of the whole year. And at that time, well, back in 2023 already, we already started talking with the local news media back in Taiwan and also the independent journalists to have this media authentication project where that we help them, support them to, with, our sol with our solution to authenticate those media content that's taken during the ele election period of time. At that time, uh, the whole the 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 impacts that we have been bringing not only just uh, globally in the media exposure, but also that we after the election time there are a few of the impact that we already made locally in Taiwan, such as that there's a, a politicians uh, who use our solution to authenticate the amendment motions in Taiwan because there's a protect protest happens in May this year, so uh, that gesture or that action basically also uh, prove that how our solution can help them validate the proof at that moment of the time. Of course, after uh, the Taiwan election, we continue working with the elections in Indonesia and also India. But then, uh, Right now, well, since the generative AI is popping out everywhere from last year till this year, all the talks, all the events that I've been to, that Every talk is about AI. Every talk is about generative AI, how it can help us, but also damage the internet at the same time. And based on what we have been working on and also all the research that's been done, it's been believed that provenance is the key to build the trust that between us and the information that we consume every day. So in numbers that we build, uh, capture as more the application where we support both individuals and business to authenticate their media content. This is also the same tool that's being used uh, during the election period of time and all the campaign they previously done. What we do basically, we bring the media content with all the metadata information that helps the creator or the brand to prove that the originality of the content, but also the life cycle of the content where this content is flow between different platforms as well. And also uh, by how generative AI been going on, almost more than half of the contents on the internet right now are going to be or already being AI-generated content. We as a human being would have the difficulty to verify this content coming actually from humans or AI, or even how should I say how I trust this content or not. So we also build a portal where it's free to use for everyone to verify the content of the information as well. So numbers uh, and numbers, we like I said, we are restoring the trust for the internet, but also that we are building a decentralized network to ensure the ensure provenance for all kinds of media content that's made by both humans and AI. We we are have been working with partners in across like creativity, news media sectors, AI, more specifically like generative AI, where we can help them to make the generative AI content more transparent. We work across that academic research, commercial area as well. And tomorrow we're going to have a talk more of what this project is and also how the capture can help different business or different application, different project to build as at the same time. So I uh, would love to talk to more. And Numbers has been a very proud member of IPF ecosystem. and. Uh, a pleasure to meet everyone here and hopefully to talk more. Thank you.
Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Begoña. I'm a head of product at Hala Systems. Um, and I would like to give you, uh, Hala Systems is not as famous as numbers of IPFS, so let me give you a very short explanation of what we do. Um, Hala System has existed over eight years, more or less. We develop data-driven technological solutions, especially to um, protect conflict areas, um, population mostly, in order to be able to increase resilience among those and also to fight uh, with accountability efforts for international crimes. So our key mission, uh, vision is to radically increase resilience for billions in peop of people in that area. We are more known for um, early warning system that uh, took place in Syria, for instance, so that we alerted via social media of different um, groups and so on, via Telegram mostly, about airstrikes that were happening uh, on the region. Um, and this is our mission, to deliver actionable information to protect everything that matters. And what we, brings me here right now, it's a more specific case. Um, I would like to bring you one of the news, there are many of them. Uh, this one is coming from Human Rights Watch. Um, it's related with the number of educational facilities that have been affected. So, for instance, for a period between February 22 until October 23, 2023, uh, more than 3,000 uh, educational facilities have been damaged and more than 300 have been totally destroyed. This is a huge risk for um, education, uh, for kids' protection, and it's even considered a war crime unless there is cons it is considered a legitimate target. What does it mean? That, for instance, if they have proofs that there are uh, military forces inside those schools, then it could be considered a military target. So this represents two major issues. On one side, the area of disinformation, misinformation, confusion, uh, and even fake news that are around that. And then the second main topic is that those evidences that there weren't, there weren't military forces in those schools could be destroyed. Those are the key vulnerabilities right now uh, for all these digital evidences, the risk of loss, tampering, or damage that is present to any digital material, but even more in these conflict areas or zones. There are new novel kinds of digital evidences that are being generated, um, and it also connects with the AI content that has been now, and it's totally, sometimes totally fake, and it's very hard to prove its authenticity. And then finally, most of this content is stored and preserved in, by large tech companies. So this represents a huge risk um, of being also destroyed at some point. So what have we done um, at Hala Systems? We have been developing, with, together with the Starling, a framework um, in which we want to lower the uncertainty, the information uncertainty, um, especially of digital evidences, in order to be able to allow investigators to move confidentially and with confidence, sorry, and with um, like hand off to prosecutors these digital evidences, making sure that the tamper proof of the chain custody of this material. So what we have done is, to, thanks to this framework that I will talk to uh, much more in, in depth tomorrow, we have developed uh, what we call a registration and preservation solution. Um, that is a service that immutably stores on one side, registers and preserves these evidences that could be any kind, it could be text, it could be audio, it could be images, um, video, over a long period of time in order to ensure that it can be um, reliable use in the future, especially because many of these investigations normally take a lot of time over the years. So very simply, um, we have the different evidences, we check which ones are valuable, um, then what we do is we hash them, so we hash the file ID, we hash the metadata of this content, and we create a bundle that we also sign to prove that we were in the possession of that file by that moment. What we do is then with this digital uh, fingerprint that we generate, we um, store it in an immutable bucket of S3, uh, Amazon Web Services, and then we register also with IPFS and the numbers protocol to make sure that it's publicly available and that we were in the possession of that file. 
I will explain a bit more tomorrow how we use it, also how all this backend um, is then surfaced, because this is one of the challenges and one of the reasons also um, of why I'm here. So how this could be easily used by our um, legal accountability experts. So if you would like to know more, I would see you tomorrow. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here learning and sharing with amazing people and with the Filecoin Foundation invitation to stay here. Um, nowadays, almost 8% of electronic waste uh, has uncertain fate. Uh, they end up on landfill or illegal marketing. And I'm Talita, I'm here with Marcelo, and we founded Gaia because we want to reboot our current model to take, produce, and dispose, because the e-waste is like a decentralized microstock micro of raw, raw materials. We have a lot of critical minerals there, and this is so important to transition to green economy, and we have to recover these materials. And because this, we built uh, uh, Gaia, we simplify simplifies the e-waste recycling to users, then we connect the e-waste uh, with the specialized recyclers. Then you can uh, see your positive impact on our web app, like CO2 saved and materials, the amount of materials recovered. And all the flow is tracked. Then we can generate recycling credits. It's super similar with the carbon markets then the manufacturers can buy these credits from Gaia and use it to offset their goals based on Brazilian laws. We have other countries that have similar laws. And in the final of the process, the users can redeem rewards. And we are using IPFS, which is support from Filecoin Foundation grant, to improve the transparency uh, around the UAC recycling. And this uh, system allows Gaia to pay all the partners in our chain and to reward the users. Then, if you want to know more, we will explain uh, on Saturday on climate uh, tracking, uh, climate and resilience and IPFS tracking. And you can use the QR code to uh, join us on Saturday and we will learn, launch uh, some NFTs to improve our work around uh, to Brazil. We started in a very small city, and right now we are working with the biggest Latin uh, e-waste recycling, and we are trying to improve our work uh, for all Brazil and other countries too. And if you, can, if you want to join us in this revolution, please use our code. Thank you. My question for you all is, you have um, a lot of the maintainers of um, different IPFS implementations, developer tools, and um, utilities here. What do you need from them um, to advance your work? Do you have feedback, wish list, hopes and dreams, complaints? I think one of the key challenges in general is how accessible this is for non-technical audience. Um, how can we explain how it works, how it could be uh, with a user-friendly UI, actually, um, how we can yeah, evangelize a bit more of this technology into, for instance, legal experts, but there are many, many more um, on the health sector, on insurance. Uh, it has a big potential, but in general, I think it's still quite siloed and quite technical in terms of how we um, talk about it. Well, I think I can totally relate it to that because I think, uh, well, I'm part of a mem uh, in the team that I'm mainly uh, taking charge of talking to a lot of business and also individual creators at the same time. So I think a lot of them, they are afraid of getting into Web3 because of those technical jargon that stop them or maybe block them as, at the same time. So I think for from numbers side that we would really like to work with the more project within the ecosystem that how uh, we can make it less tech, or much easier that maybe it's a human language they can the general can understand or even to develop uh, the application that's more easier for them to adopt 
uh, I think more people are getting used to having the wallet to store their assets, store their data. And I think that's a huge step for a lot of business out there. I see that they are adopting wallets within, the, within their service platforms. So I think we can do a lot more uh, by the time progress. Uh, you're, I think you're gonna love some of the presentations coming up right after this. <laughs> uh, when we started to talk uh, about Web3 and IPFS, especially in Brazil, because it's super new, uh, subject there, uh, we have to explain how important this uh, is to recycling because we have a lot of fraud in this sector right now. They um, mislead the numbers and the IPFS can help us to improve this transparency because uh, they uh, created more results uh, in uh, the recycling than in when we use IPFS we can uh, prove that uh, we have a uniqueness results. Then uh, explain this is helping us to uh, um, show for people that is not complicated than seems and that is not a trend. It's a really important technology and this is helping, like she said, to explain people that is not too complicated. It's a technology that can help us. We can simpl simplify that integrating Web2 and Web3. This is uh, we are doing right now. So I heard no complaints about the software. Your software is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a lot about the communication, though. I'm, ju I'm just kidding. Is there uh, anything from the room? Any questions? Yes, and I'll repeat it so it... it uh, great. Uh, th thank you. Very interesting presentations. I'm uh, Francis, Francis Crawley with CoData, which is the Committee on Data of the International Science Council, and COARA, which is the Coalition for the Advancement of Research Assessment here in Brussels and in Europe. Don't hate me for my question or saying who I am, but um, so I just came back from a meeting in Geneva with UNESCO and CoData, looking at data policy for times of crisis facilitated by open science. How do we bring these kinds of tools and possibilities into the places where we can make not only the implementation of policy, but also bring these tools and this understanding into the policies? And I'm gonna be very frank here. I think it's very difficult to do because the people in Geneva or the people here in Brussels, they govern and they want to govern. So they don't govern you. This is the, and they don't govern the tools you bring to them. But we have to find this connection between those who govern and those who innovate and those who, yeah, want to open, bring open science, I should say, and, and bring these possibilities to, to society. And I think this is a very hard trick to do. And that's why I'm here, so thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, well, I, there might be some opportunities to talk more about that this afternoon um, in the open science track. Uh, and I also wanna give a shout out to the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. They have training programs for technologists to influence policy, whether it's by writing, advocacy, lobbying. Um, there's some great programs, so maybe that's something else that our community can, can look at participating in and taking an advantage of. Um, I hate to cut this short, but I think we can continue this over the next few days. Um, thank you again to these panelists.